University of Newcastle. And joining me today in this webinar is Aidan Wilson, who is the e-research analyst at the Australian Catholic University, and Wei-Si Chen, who is the intersect e-research analyst at the University of Technology, Sydney. Now, um, before we get started, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, and we recognise their continuing connection to the land, waters and culture. And we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So before we get started on our subject matter today, we're going to go through a little introduction on Intersect. So we are actually a not-for-profit membership-based e-research organisation, and we currently operate across five states and territories in Australia. So we were formed in 2008 by a group of New South Wales universities, and we're governed by a consortium of 13 Australian universities who are all our members. Now, we provide universities and their researchers advice on the use of technology in research. We provide training in research technology tools, and we also have the capability to develop high quality software for research use. So here's a list of our current members. As you can see, they are mostly New South Wales members, but we also have a presence in the ACT, Victoria and South Australia. So Intersex e-research e support model is based around the concept of an e-research analyst, and they're the primary interface between Intersect and our member organisations. They're based on campus at our member universities and work in conjunction with the support framework that already exists with that member organisation. So this slide also demonstrates the cross-institutional collaboration with the e-research analysts, uh, helping each other with shared problems. So the role of the e-research analyst combines an IT needs analysis, business analysis, researcher engagement across a very broad range of world-class research activities. Their responsibilities include providing advice to researchers, gathering specific specific IT requirements, uh, helping guide the development and deployment of relevant re of relevant e-research services, and increasing the visibility and acceptance of good e-research practice. One of the main services we provide at Intersect is training in various research technologies. So these are delivered both, both in person and online. Uh, our and our interactive hands-on training is designed to improve research productivity and support world-class research by imparting e-research skills and support to researchers. So since 2008, we've delivered over 1,300 of these research technology courses and had over 17,000 attendees across our 13 member um, universities and research organisations. <clears throat> so our webinar today forms part of our fully open research technology webinar series that's suitable for HDR students, researchers and professional staff and commenced in July this year. So our first webinar was Start Coding Without Hesitation, uh, Python versus R versus MATLAB and Julia, followed by a showcase of data analysis in Python and R, uh, a case study using COVID-19 data. The next webinar in our series will be in October and we'll be looking at research, te research computing technologies. Now, you can find all the details of our webinars, as well as the information on our training courses by visiting learn.intersect.org.au. And you can see there's a link to our webpage here. We might have a bit of time to go through it later, but you'll see not only do we do training in the tools we're talking about today, but also, also a range of tools in data analysis, data management, um, programming and research computing. Okay, we'll now move on to um, our subject matter at hand today when we're looking at our um, REDCap and Qualtrics. So for this presentation, we are going to be looking at, just let the slide catch up here. So we're going to be looking, uh, we're going to be referring to the concept of electronic data capture as a method of collecting data from study participants. So examples include, but definitely aren't limited to simple surveys, uh, data entry forms used by a research team or data collectors, uh, longitudinal studies following participants over time, or a clinical trial in, in which at least one group undergoes some form of intervention, another group does not, and then ultimately the two are compared. So. An important distinction in electronic data capture is that between forms and surveys. When we think of forms, we think of something that consists of a researcher or an assistant filling in information provided by the participant or on behalf of the participant. 
So for example, if someone stops you in the street for a brief questionnaire where they ask you questions and you respond verbally, that data is be re being recorded in a form. Another example of this might be an epidemiological study where a hospital makes available de-identified records, which include demographic details and medical observations while they are admitted, which the researcher then subsequently enters into a database before analyzing it for any trends. A survey is essentially where the study participant enters the data themselves, such as an anonymous online questionnaire or a questionnaire as part of a broader study, the results from which can be aligned with other data collected via forms. Another important concept in data collection is that of anonymous data as compared to confidential data. So anonymous means no one knows who has participated in the study. For a study to be anonymous, the data collection must take place in a particular manner and appropriate tools must be employed to ensure that no identifiable information, such as the participant's IP address, email or name, for example, is collected. Anonymous data collection usually takes the form of online surveys, but they still have to be set up correctly in order to ensure full anonymity. Confidential data means that, a, that personally identifiable, identifiable information is collected because it needs to be. For example, in a longitudinal study, the participants need to be able to be contacted by the study team for later data collection, and the data they contribute to the project needs to be aligned to their earlier responses so that proper analysis can take place. The challenge with confidential studies is to manage the data in such a way that you can make assurances to your participants that their information will remain safe. This means that if you collect data via telephone or face-to-face -face interview, you cannot call this data anonymous. It might be a good time to mention at this point that your ethics approval will also require you to tell your uh, participants how their data is collected, stored and managed for any kind of study and you must inform them whether it is anonymous or confidential data. Now, there are of course many electronic data capture tools available to researchers depending on your local institution. While today we're obviously focusing on two of the most popularly used tools in Qualtrics and REDCap, many other options do exist. Some of the more common ones include Question Pro, Lime Survey, SurveyMonkey, or using Microsoft or Google Forms. Now, while all of these platforms have their own advantages and disadvantages when it comes to research, it just simply isn't possible to review them all in today's webinar. So now I'm gonna hand over to Aiden, who's going to be looking at Qualtrics for us. Thanks, Sean. Um, so yes, I'll be talking about uh, Qualtrics, which is a tool uh, that I, uh, I'm i one of the administrators at ACU. Uh, I also administer RedCap, uh, but I've, I, work, I work across both of them. And I think they're both great for their um, individual, um, uh, for the right, for certain things. So uh, I'll be discussing Qualtrics. Uh, and Qualtrics was originally developed uh, for market research and not for academic research, and also for business intelligence data collection. But it can also be used a lot, uh, it is also used a lot by researchers, most notably um, in the fields of psychology and so forth, but, uh, but really any field. It features an easy to use interface to designing a survey and distributing it to participants. However, Qualtrics doesn't have the same level of controls over sensitive data as something like REDCap, and so may not be the best choice if you're collecting personal information or uh, personal health information. Firstly, Qualtrics and all data is held on Qualtrics servers, which depending on the details of your university's or your faculty's license could be located in US data centers, which could be problematic. So it's best to check with your university's research, research office or ethics team about, which, uh, about whether you can use Qualtrics for your project. Secondly, Qualtrics only provides limited options to anonymize data. Uh, also, as we will see, it is not able to handle longitudinal data collection very well, and so is only really suited to simple surveys. Qualtrics is a very simple program to start using and has a very intuitive point and click interface with controls that appear as you need them and the more advanced controls available if you start looking. They have clearly spent a lot of effort uh, designing a user interface that works very well. It gives users control over display and skip logic to control whether questions show up or not. And with what's called survey flow to control how a participant proceeds through whole parts or blocks of a survey. Uh, a user can pipe values from the data set into a question, email or other text area for better personalization of the survey experience and other users. Uh, there's an impressive array of question types with useful defaults for lots of different use cases. Users can also manage contact lists and even automate the generation of those contact lists from responses to surveys. Finally, users can intuitively and simply build reports 
that update with new data and share them via a link and optional password. So I'll just show some screenshots of what uh, Qualtrics looks like in action. So it's got this, this clean, intuitive interface with controls that pop up uh, only when you need them. Uh, those are the controls popping up. Um, uh, there is a vast array of question types with plenty of predefined defaults for things like Likert scales and other question types and the capacity for images in question types, complex matrix fields, etc. Uh, there's a great preview system that shows both web view and mobile view for your surveys. This screenshot also, by the way, shows that you can pipe values from the data for personalization or other purposes. The survey flow option allows you to determine which blocks of questions show at what points for a given respondent, depending on some logic. A simple use case for this might be, uh, as the screenshot shows, if the, if the answer to consent is yes, then proceed on to the, the next blocks, otherwise go straight to the end of the survey. Another example might be to channel some participants, for example, those over 18 to one path through the survey and those under 18 through a different path. You can also randomize the appearance of blocks in the survey flow to reduce bias in your data collection. Qualtrics provides a very simple interface for managing contacts, which is essentially a list of people that you may want to invite to take your survey. Contact lists contain email addresses at a bare minimum, but, other, but any other field type is possible and user definable. Moreover, you can utilize the values of those fields in the survey that your participants are invited to. Uh, and for example, show them a slightly different experience if they meet certain logic in their contact details. The classic example of this is language. So you can automatically start a participant off in a survey of the correct language for their preferences as recorded in the contact list. In this regard, Qualtrics has an edge over REDCap in that uh, participant lists in REDCap can only contain email addresses, but there's a different design in REDCap for this and those values would actually be imported into the data set um, that the surveys and forms then also contribute to. But Wacy will talk more about that soon. There's also a means of automatically populating contact lists based on responses to your surveys and logic. For example, if you want people to volunteer for a focus group, you can ask them in a survey that in a survey they're taking whether they would like to participate. And if they say yes, open up a form where they input their contact details. A contact list trigger, which is shown on the screen there, can then automatically feed those details into a contact list ready for you to send out invitations to the focus group or otherwise export their details for use in another application. Surveys also feature a very simple distribution system that allows you to send unique links to a contact list or a portion thereof. And Qualtrics will automatically track which recipients have completed the survey and which haven't, although it won't let you know that for, uh, it won't let you identify people for privacy reasons. Knowing this, it can then automate reminders to be sent to those who have not yet completed the survey and thank you messages to all those who have. Qualtrics also supports distribution via an, an anonymous link or by QR code or social media, but these options do not have the same options around reminders and thank yous because it fundamentally doesn't know who those recipients are. Another great feature of Qualtrics is the built-in reports engine. Users can build reports based on responses in the data uh, or even across different projects with a simple and intuitive interface that combines text elements and headers and charts loaded and so are dynamic and they can also be made available using a URL and optional password allowing you to share your results with for example a supervisor or even more widely. As to some of the limitations, uh, Qualtrics falls short on some important features. Um, for one thing it is a software as a service offering rather than, a, a, rather than an application that is locally installed on the university's infrastructure. This means that the data is managed by Qualtrics and depending on your university's license, the data uh, may not be stored in Australia at all. The features for collaborating are limited depending on your university's institution, uh, sorry, your institution's license. Um, you should be able to share a project with anyone from inside your uni and possibly uh, those with Qualtrics accounts at other institutions or personal accounts. But you can only choose to allow uh, or disallow um, edit view reports, activate, deactivate, copy and distribute. What this means is that if someone is allowed to view any data in a Qualtrics project, then they can view any data. Uh, they can view all data in that project. Another limitation is that Qualtrics has a one-to-one -one relationship between a project and a survey. In other words, a survey is a project and a project is a survey. 
This means there's no concept of repeating a survey multiple times over many events. And somewhat related, there's no way to link responses from one individual across multiple time points. This ultimately makes Qualtrics unsuitable for longitudinal projects. There are workarounds to this, but they're not great. One workaround is to ask the participant to enter their email address, which allows the user to then either um, use that email address to invite the participant to subsequent surveys, thus emulating a longitudinal project, or alternatively use that email address as a primary key to link responses together for data analysis. But this is pretty unsafe uh, and requires the project team to inspect the personal information in order to make sense of the data. Another method to solve this latter problem a little bit less, um, a little bit more securely is to ask respondents to generate their own primary key um, uh, using some easily repeatable method, like for example, ask them for the first two letters of their surname, the first letter of their birth month, and the last four digits of their phone number. The idea being that users will have to fill this in every time the survey is run or for every survey that is run and the team can use that code to join those responses together across different projects. This is better, but it's still highly error prone and relies on people uh, entering that information correctly uh, into a survey each time. So onto use cases. The most typical use case for Qualtrics is a simple survey, uh, but the, these probably account for, and these probably account for the majority of data collection activities. Um, at ACU, where, I, uh, where I'm the e-research analyst, uh, Qualtrics is used uh, for a lot of business data collection as well, such as course evaluations. Qualtrics um, should only be used where rights don't need to, where user rights don't need to be too advanced. Most simply, if a project only has a single user like a PhD or honor student, then it works well in a Qualtrics environment. Another use case, which is possibly less explored, is using Qualtrics as a sort of smart landing page uh, for providing information that depends on logic and where no data collection is necessary. ACU, for example, uses Qualtrics in this way for undergraduate enrollment processes. So applicants are sent a link to a survey where they enter some details like which campus they'll be attending and what sort of social events they're uh, interested in. And then they're presented with personalized information such as induction videos and hyperlinks to other resources where they can follow up. Uh, I'll now hand over to Wei Si who will discuss RedCap. Thanks, Aiden. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Wei Si Chen. I'm the uh, Intersect E-Research e Analyst based at UTS. And uh, one of my uh, responsibilities um, is actually, you know, administrating uh, anim uh, as the administrator of RedCap for UTS researchers. <clears throat> so, what is RedCap? RedCap is short for Research Electronic Data Capture, which is a powerful online application built and maintained by University of uh, Vanderbilt in 2004. It was initially designed for running clinical trials, but it's also been extended to be capable of running uh, simple surveys, as Qualtrics does, or data collection forms. So the difference between service and data collection forms has been illustrated by Sean. So surveys are basically entered uh, by participants using the survey links, but data collection forms are normally collecting data by the staff. Um, so this is pretty standard in clinical trials where a clinician uh, would enter both identify information for a subject plus relative, uh, relevant medical results into a secure portal. Uh, it is a free for not-for-profits. It's not open source, but uh, uh, not-for-profit organizations, including universities, can actually control over who can access the software through a license. Uh, we won't go into the details about the license, but um, the purpose is to keep to ensure that um, RedCap maintains high security com compliance. Uh, RedCap is self-hosted. Uh, it's not a service as a, uh, sorry, software as a service. Uh, so it's actually required by the license. This means that uh, the application and all the data um, resides on the premise in the institutional uh, local data centers. Uh, which is a big positive when it comes to complying with privacy legislations and ARC funding rules. However, a drawback is that, unfortunately, uh, RedCap has a, a steep learning curve, um, you know, which is a little bit more difficult than uh, um, Qualtrics to start with. However, if you actually get used to uh, 
you know, the, all the features covered in Red, Red Cap, you, you will find it very powerful. Um, but you have to, you know, keep, keep in mind that it has a more difficult interface to interact with. Um, REDCap is very much a niche product for use in medical, clinical, and health research. Um, and so it doesn't concentrate much on looking pretty or having an intuitive interface, as I've just mentioned. Um, instead, it's focusing on extending the features and maintaining strong control over your data and privacy. It has a simple enough interface, we call it online designer, for building forms using uh, uh, and supports offline editing in Excel um, or whatever um, uh, spreadsheet editor. Um, REDCap supports all the common field types, but does not have the same attention to pre-configured defaults that Qualtrics has. Like any data capture application, um, it, uh, REDCap actually supports branching logic and uh, piping, but unlike the other options, it also supports calculated fields, um, which allows the users to uh, configure some simple or even very complex calculation formulas or you know, equations within a form or, or survey. The classic example um, would be you can actually calculate BMI out of uh, the height and weight entered by the user. Um, and then the BMI field is stored as a separate field and it can be used in evaluations or uh, inside a branching logic for, to show a different question. So you can say, you know, when the BMI is higher than a particular threshold, uh, that particular question can be shown, otherwise it will be hidden. Um, but this one is actually a little bit more complicated um, uh, for a new user to set up. So you have to get used to it and learn how to build you know, a, a calculated field. RedCat fundamentally works very well with events, um, repetitions, and uh, it can manage participants through the events in a longitudinal survey, uh, a longitudinal study. So you can also divide your um, uh, participants into different arms. We'll talk about it later in the examples. So basically, for example, you can do a group for uh, the control and another intervention group to compare the differences uh, of a drug. Um, so in these two different arms, you can set up different uh, lists of events. We, we can consider them as different workflows. Um, and in each workflow, you can have repetitions or a uh, different order of your existing forms. Also, RedCap provides users with extremely good control over uh, user rights and uh, their access to your data, reports, and exports. Uh, and it's quite suited to uh, projects in which a team of people might have different roles on a project. For example, you have data entry people, you have people designing the survey who has uh, all the permissions, you have the person who is managing the project who can set up user rights for other people. Um, you can also say, you know, uh, I have external people to be included in the project, say clinical staff uh, in a hospital context who need to enter the data for, the, for a patient. Okay, here are some examples of uh, REDCap and uh, um, uh, it shows the features around data security, uh, the things I've mentioned above uh, before. So in this example, you can see that a user can be given specific access to different functions including uh, full permissions, highest uh, level privileges uh, for design and setup, and uh, whether they can uh, uh, set up user rights for other people. Um, and also, you might also notice that uh, you can limit users to only seeing data which is de-identified. So that means um, when adding fields, you can indicate which fields are identifiers, and uh, you can make sure that uh, the right people will automatically be uh, we'll, we'll automatically see the full data set, but uh, the rest of the people will only see the identified uh, data out of the data set when they export it. Um, also, you, um, you can see from the right, right hand side, you can limit users to only seeing data um, within one particular form. And uh, for, each, each, uh, for each survey or form, you can, you can actually set um, whether they have read-only access, uh, view and edit access for each particular survey. This screenshot illustrates um, one key difference between Quadrix and REDCap, which is that um, REDCap allows a project to contain many different instruments. So we have three instruments here. Um, and each instrument can be set up as 
one survey. So you can make it Okay, so this is a more complicated example. So uh, in a more compli complex uh, RedCat project, you can say you can add, you know, as many instruments as you want, which is different from Quadrix. In, you know, in Quadrix, you have only one survey per uh, project. But in RedCat, we can actually have uh, um, different instruments and each, uh, each instrument can have a different purpose. Say here we have a couple of uh, demographic and uh, uh, project related forms and several follow-up forms. Continuing on this particular project, um, you can align, uh, line up different instruments within events. Um, this may look a little bit complicated. You can see uh, horizontally here, um, the headers. We have enrollment, three months, six months, and 12 months as different stages. Uh, we call them events. And each event can have a series of uh, forms or surveys as part of the workflow. Um, and on the top, you can see I've got uh, eight arms, which means I've split the uh, participant, uh, participants into eight different groups. Um, they might be, you know, for different drugs, so they might be for different locations, um, and they might be from for different hospitals. So all these sort of things can be, can be divided using arms. And for each arm, you can define the workflow for different events. Um, and a nice feature for RedCap is that you can set up an, an automatic email that can be sent to the right group of people, you know, uh, at the right time point. For example, you can set up an automatic email saying um, these participants will receive an email after the enrollment, three months after the enrollment, they will receive an invitation to do the three month follow up. Okay, as a summary. Um, as I've mentioned several times before, REDCap uh, has a steep uh, learning curve and um, uh, use, users typically won't be able to dive in uh, themselves uh, and start using it without first and, uh, either and, uh, attending some, att uh, some training or spending some time regarding uh, reading the built-in materials, including the help page and FAQ pages. Um, the interface is not pretty. It's not as intuitive as uh, uh, Quartrix. Um, and there are some options for users to modify colors and fonts. However, these options are limited compared with other tools like Quadrix. Some basic features are still missing. Um, although um, uh, RedCap is being uh, actively developed and uh, maintained with up, uh, updates regularly. Um, so like the ability to configure a field that has multiple subfields, like an address field with multiple parts, including uh, street number, street name, suburb, etc. While um, there are some use, uh, usually some external modules or plugins that you can use to, um, to actually get access to these uh, features. However, they're not built in. So it might be within the ad administrator's capability to do that, but not achievable uh, by normal users. Here are some uh, typical user use cases for REDCap. Um, it's, it's been pretty clear that uh, where the boundary between uh, uh, Quadrix and RedCap uh, is by now. Uh, and RedCap is actually suited to the most complex requirements of uh, longitudinal studies and clinical trials, but it can also be used to do simple surveys, except that it might be like using a cannon to uh, kill a fly. So, and also the, the look of the survey might not be as, as good as Quadrix. So the common use cases include um, if you want to do longitudinal projects, if you need to uh, control over uh, control um, user access requirements, you know you want to set up very complex user access uh, um, roles, or uh, if you want to manage uh, sensitive data, uh, the data you're collecting include a lot of sensitive information, um, or if you require uh, data auditing or if you want to do uh, you know, the study uh, with multiple different, different arms. Um, and all these cases, you should consider using RedCap over Quadrix um, as uh, RedCap is designed for these purposes at the very beginning. Okay, so now I'll hand it back over to Sean uh, to do the final recommendation and summary. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Wasey. So um, obviously any, any final recommendations is kind of very general in nature and um, everyone's individual use case needs to be considered, but we can hardly do a presentation 
comparing a couple of data capture tools without providing some final advice. So in general, we would probably recommend researchers look to a tool similar to like Qualtrics just to begin with um, and only move on to RedCamp when you need to. And that could be because you, are, you have a longitudinal project, you're collecting sensitive data, or you may need um, final If you're collecting survey data for a simple honours project, for example, the steeper learning curve of REDCap initially may make it unsuitable um, since you'll have shorter timeframes to work with and you know it could just be a one-off survey. That said, if your project requires longitudinal data, it might be worth the effort initially to learn REDCap as it's going to handle this more simply in the long run. Now, also depending on your institution or university, they may require you to use REDCap for a project that collects sensitive data or where the project is deemed high risk by your HREC. So you should always check with your research office or HREC when deciding which tool you use to make sure you're using the appropriate one and then you can subsequently get the appropriate assistance. Now, as a side of this, we've obviously um, talked a lot about research, but Qualtrics is a nice tool as well to be used for data collection that's not research-based, so operational or administrative, as is in that example Aiden gave. So where can we can find support for these tools? Um, for Qualtrics, there's excellent online documentation and you can generally find this uh, information about every feature on their site. Just be aware though, that depending on the license or access that you have, you may not actually have access to every feature. They also have a very good support site and a good community forum for peer assistance. Um, Another good place to find support might be your university's local brand administrator. Um, if you're unsure who that is, I'm sure you could check with your IT department, they'll be able to point you in the right direction. As for RedCamp, there's also very good built-in FAQ. Um, once you start using RedCamp, you'll find that there's hyperlinks all over the place to jump you to a particular video or a particular section of help on, on the certain feature you're looking at. Um, and it explains the use of most of these features. So, there's lots of online training materials as well, and your local admin should be able to point you in the direction of those. Um, while we're talking about your admin, they're generally a very good source of support, and you should be able to find their details from within any REDCap project page. Just look for the big contact REDCap administrator page, uh, button in any page. Uh, as far as training, uh, Qualtrics offer their own self-paced free online um, training called XM Basecamp, which you can access at their website. So like I said, it's free and self-paced, but if you wanted to um, be certified in Qualtrics, you can pay for certification and complete a test after this, which may allow you to offer professional services to others. Uh, Intersect also provides training, which is free for researchers from our member universities. Um, although we all also do offer um, paid training for non-members of our training, we have an introductory Qualtrics course and are currently in the process of developing an advanced Qualtrics course, which will be ready for delivery in 2021. We already have an introductory and advanced course in REDCap, um, <clears throat> looking at basic data collection and surveys and randomization and longitudinal trials with REDCap. So you can keep an eye on the schedule of upcoming courses on our website and look out for courses at your university if you can't find this course happening at your university or you are, um, you can contact your local e-research analyst um, or if you are from a non-member institution looking for training, feel free to reach out and um, contact our training team. Now that concludes all our material today. We have a fair few, we have some questions to go through. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to jump on the, um, the chat or jump in the, uh, Q&A as well. So we have had a couple answered already, but I might just read them out. So in case anyone wasn't following along the chat. So we have had a question, um, Aiden, which one out of Qualtrics or REDCap is the best for collecting descriptive type or story-based data? Uh, yep, and um, uh, my answer to this was that both, you know, both are capable, but uh, which one you choose will, will, will depend on other considerations like uh, your you know, research design needs, like do you have complex user rights or do you have longitudinal data collection needs? Um, but uh, supporting descriptive type and story-based data is, uh, is equally supported by either, either platform. 
you know, we also had a question in the chat about um, embedding videos in our surveys. Now, both tools can do that. Um, uh, there, there are no specific survey, uh, no video design tools within RedCap or Qualtrics, but there is a possibility of it. Uh, I've worked in a lot of projects where we take intervention. Uh, we can, you know, send out a RedCap survey link in the longitude study with an embedded video in there, and we can check that the person's, you know, RedCap gives us the ability to follow up on if someone has accessed a survey we've sent them, if they've got to the end of it. We can even do things like embed timing measures. So we can see that, you know, if we sent someone a 10 minute video, we can check if they just click through and clicked after four seconds and, you know, they didn't actually participate in our intervention that, that we're looking at. So both of them have the ability to do that, but effectively we're just, we're streaming them from an outside source. And that, yeah, that's most typical. So both um, will allow you to embed videos or images that are sourced uh, from, you can upload images, um, of course, but um, you may be able to upload videos, but in Qualtrics, it's essentially uploading to a location where you can, where you can source them from within your, within your, your, your survey. Um, the, but the most typical way to go would be to upload your video to something like YouTube uh, as a private uh, unlisted video and then embed that in, in Qualtrics. The same goes for RedCap. Yeah, that's definitely how Qualtrics does give you the ability, like Aiden said, to upload the video. But I think they, they even have a little recommendation that says, yeah, you can upload this, but we recommend you, ho you actually host this on a video streaming site like Vimeo or YouTube. You set the privacy setting and use that to actually host the video and stream it through um, the survey. Um, yeah, we have another question about will, will, with Qualtrics, can the form contain images? Yeah, certainly, as, as Aiden explained, we can do that. Um, and we do that in RedCap as well. There's another question there about, uh, about translations, multilingual surveys. Um, uh, Qualtrics is definitely better at doing translations of, uh, of surveys. It's, um, it's got a, a, a feature where you can add a language. Um, you can export the you know, the primary language might be English, um, and then use a spreadsheet to basically add translations for every question, descriptive text element, every answer choice label, and so forth, um, and upload that into Qualtrics, and it will, it will turn that into a new language, which um, is available to people as a drop-down list, a, a drop-down option on the front page, um, and I think is even configurable from um, an embedded field like uh, a, the language field in the contact list. Um, Redcap can do it using an external module, um, which is basically a plugin. But um, it's it's a, it's quite complex, um, and it do, it certainly doesn't work as nicely as it does in Qualtrics. Um, there's a question. I was going to type out the answer, but I might just answer it now. Um, in Qualtrics, if a participant provides contact details to potentially participate in a focus group after completing a survey, is that stored separately so their survey response remains anonymous, um, i.e. so their contact details are not linked to the survey responses? Very good question. I get this question a lot when I support uh, Qualtrics. The, um, the way I recommend people do this is to set up a separate Qualtrics project um, which uh, only collects the, the contact information for those people who volunteer to, you know, uh, participate in the focus group. This also goes for a prize draw. So if you'd like to go in the, in the draw to win a book voucher, for example, um, but you don't need to, um, you don't need everybody to do that. Uh, so they can volunteer into it. Um, you would have that as a separate project from your main data collection. And that separate project has an anonymous URL that you tell Qualtrics in the first project to redirect people to once they've completed the first survey. Um, so that means that if they choose to enter their contact details, they're, pr they're listed in a separate project entirely. And so their data can't be related uh, back to the first one. And you would let them know in the question that asks for their email address that, that the details can't be uh, used to link their responses. Um, you could also, by the way, do this um, in RedCap. So it's a, RedCap also has a redirect people to, a, to a, an arbitrary URL at the end of the, at the, end of the survey. Okay, so we do have another question here. So as someone who needs to survey with children and young people, is REDCap able to run a code prompt to send an email or text to a provided number for verification before adding the data to the data set? Uh, 
uh, for verification before adding the data to the data set. I don't really understand the question. Um, RedCap is extremely flexible and able to be coded to do various things. Um, I have worked with people that have used RedCap to You put in, for example, you have a, a, a field where you enter the date of birth, and then you might automatically determine their age. And if they fall underneath a certain threshold, then uh, their parent is emailed a consent form, for example. Um, and if they're over a certain threshold, then then a certain age. So if they're over 18, then they can be sent the consent form. Um, doesn't sound like that's exactly what you're asking for, um, though. So. Uh, Caitlin, if you could clarify the question in the chat or something, then maybe we can, um, then maybe we can um, address it, answer it better. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll grab this next one. So, do both programs have the same level of participant management for follow-up, and does RedCap allow automatic sending of secondary surveys as part of a series? Yes, you you have excellent control over the. Um, survey invitations. Uh, Wacy touched on it briefly about, so we have automated survey invitations where we can set up, um, you know, to go at certain times. We can also insert logic into these invitations. So you may say only invite this person to survey number three, the third step, if they've completed survey number two. We can say, you know, I, I actually need a week's break between the completion of one survey. Time. So you can time it by elapsed days, not just specific dates. You have immense control over everything you can do. Um, in fact, in a more recent version, so um, uh, I just upgraded the dev instance of RedCap to this version um, at ACU recently. Um, you can, you can ha collect a date in the data. So for example, a date of, a date, the date of the next clinical visit, um, which might be two months away. And uh, then RedCap can be configured to send a reminder email to that person, possibly with a link, an invitation to do surveys prior to the clinical visit, uh, which will it'll automatically send, for example, a week before the survey, uh, before the visit, um, uh, by saying, you know, send this alert seven days before this date field um, is is before this date, basically. Yeah, for example, a, pro a similar thing. I'm working on a project at the moment where we have. Um, you know, a screening survey run through RedCap initially, and then if the participants, uh, if the child is eligible, so the the parent is filling out this form, they get given an appointment. We're storing that appointment in um, uh, RedCap, and if the parent has elected earlier on, do you want to complete these surveys on the day, or will someone else be bringing the child to the appointment? If you've ticked yes, um, I want to complete this beforehand, three days before the actual appointment, the parent then gets emailed the links to the survey. So you have control over, over all sorts of, of distributions. Um, the same thing sort of applies. You can um, distribute surveys in one project to two different emails if you need to. Um, so you can assign a contact email at a project level, as well as assigning a contact email at a survey level as well, um, which is one of the, another one of those advantages um, that we talked about with the concept of RedCap where one project doesn't necessarily equal one form or one survey. We can have multiple surveys or forms in the one project. So can the consent form and participant information be sent along with the Coltrix uh, form? So generally, any, any particular advice on that, you'd, you'd want to talk to your local HREC. Um, From my I know, perspective, I, I recommend people um, uh, start off their surveys, whether they're in RedCap or Qualtrics, with the uh, participant information as a field in the survey, and also then provide the uh, the PDF as a link to download um, and embed that link in in the in the. So the first thing people read when they click on the survey link um, is they read the participant information letter. They're given an opportunity to download it as well. Um, uh, so yes, you can embed all of this stuff in both Qualtrics and RedCap as descriptive text field that allow you to do rich text editing, like configure headers and uh, italics and bold and different colors and so forth. And again, embed uh, a PDF letter um, in in the fields as well. Yeah, we we have the same sort of process at Newcastle. Hatrex, you know, it's 
recommend put put it on screen and not just have it as the link because you know we want to make it as easy as possible for our participants to actually access the information and read it um, you can click this link you may not be actually giving them um, proper consent because you're not making it as easy for the person. Um, this is probably a good point to mention. REDCap itself has an excellent e-consent framework built in um, to it. So it is set up and you, you activate it as um, an e-consent and it tells you the fields you need, a signature, a, um, a first name and a last name. And what it will do is, and of course it can collect a signature by finger on a phone or an iPad. You could have a, you can use it with a mouse, a digital signing pad, whatever you need. And then what REDCap will do for you is the very next page, you know, have a statement that this is the equivalent of a signed consent form and give the participant right at that point an option to download and print their signed consent form. Um, and also the, require them to read and verify the details are correct. Yes. An, and an important step for, um, I mean, REDCap comes from the US, it comes from clinical research, so it has HIPAA compliance. Um, the the e-consent framework is compliant with, I'm, I'm going to rem not remember the acronym, CRF part 11, I think is what the acronym is, which is um, the, I think the legislation in the US around what is considered trustworthy collection of, uh, of consent um, in an electronic form. Um, so, uh, so, Yes, I think you know. I agree with Sean that the, the, the Redcap's consent framework is is very good, and I recommend people use it a lot. Uh, so, Caitlin, oh yeah, so a bit more clarification on your question. Um, yeah, in short, you can put in, you know, if it is like a first screening survey, and the person says, you know, I'm below the 13 year old threshold. Um, you know, I want to get their parents' consent. You can certainly ask for um, a parent's email address and then use that once that uh, first survey is completed and the child said, yes, I want to participate. Here's my parent's email. You can certainly then send off the next survey and it can be a simple yes or no to that parent, contain a bit of information about your study. And then, you know, that child can go no further until you've received back that um, survey saying yes. And the good thing about it being, if it's in red cap, is that it's all linked to this one record. So there's no going back and marrying this up and saying, okay, who was this yes from? Is this one? It's all part of the one record. So you can automatically set it up from the very start to say, don't send the next survey or don't let this person participate any further until I've received back the guardian consent form. It's fully customizable. So uh, yeah, you have full control over all the instruments you've got. And uh, you can control the process. So basically, you know, you can send out uh, notification alerts, um, you know, to decide what to do next. So it's um, very flexible. So uh, once you get into it, you find it very powerful. Yeah, the, the, like Wacey said, the notifications are very powerful. I've been working on a lot of projects lately, um, mental health based, where people are uh, answering mental health questionnaires for certain number of um, certain combination of answers are selected we've set up REDCap to automatically email the um, research team because they may need to um, initiate an intervention outside of the research project and you can do that instantly. Mm. So you just, you have such great flexibility in terms of that with um, REDCap. Yeah, the, lo the logic is, is really very rich. Um, and the way, and the, the, you know, ways he touched on the calculated, uh, calculated fields, so you could do automated scoring within a REDCap instrument. So you might have, for example, the DAS-21, the Depression, Anxiety and Stress Score. Um, and uh, you, you can have a field that calculates the depression um, uh, score and the anxiety score and the stress score um, uh, and do things on the basis of those values. So if the score is above four, then as Sean said, automatically email the, the, the project team and say, you need to you need to get in touch with this with this person. Um, the same goes for if you know if someone's uh, uh, blood glucose level returns too high a number, they can automatically be sent um, uh, a referral straight out of Redcap to take to their GP. Um, for example, this is all this is all very easily customizable. Um, it could be done, I have to say, in Qualtrics. Qualtrics does have the capacity to do arithmetic operations on values, but it is far less 
simple than it is in Red Cap. Um, they don't have multiple forms that's, um, uh, you know, so you can't um, actually customize what to do next. It has yes, to be all right. within and, one project. Yeah. Yeah. Are these able to be connected to in vivo? So in vivo does have direct integrate. Uh, yeah, in vivo has direct integration with Qualtrics. So you can um, connect from your in vivo project, log straight into your Qualtrics account using an API, get your this, data. This might be institution dependent though, because the API is not um, access to the API, which I think the Envivo connector needs, yes. uh, is not something that comes in the base package. So it might be something that your university doesn't have. Yeah, and you have to, generally speaking, you have to get approval off the brand administrator, even if you do have it, to say, yes, I'm happy for them to access this project, release the API key for this project. Um, As it happens, the API in REDCap is very good and is available to everybody. It's free. There's no, no extra... There's no charge for Recap at all, but there's no extra charge for things like the, 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 the API key, which means that you can easily connect it with, uh, I mean, there might be, there wouldn't be a connector from in vivo, but one could, if they were, you know, able to do some programming, they could write, um, for example, an R script that pulled down all the data from Redcap, performed the analysis, and then outputted some uh, a, a data set ready to be opened up in in vivo. Yeah, so yeah, actually, you know, um the Insect in Vivo training course, we actually use survey data from a Qualtrics survey. We don't use the integration because not everyone has the integration, but yes, you can definitely get any of your data out of any survey tool because um, Vivo will accept your survey data in a CSV, an Excel, a TSV, any form, all your survey tools can export your data in that format. In vivo can then accept it and you can, um, there is a process for setting it up in in vivo, um, how you code it, where you decide if something's open-ended or closed-ended, you give a unique identifier. But in essence, yes, all your survey data that you collect is um, able to be analyzed in in vivo. Uh, a question just popped up. If participants are given a voucher after filling in a form, can it go immediately or does it go separately? Um, I presume you're referring to Qualtrics and what I uh, was speaking about before with, with uh, 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 book vouchers and so forth. People have, and, and I, I'm aware of people doing this in RedCap as well, um, people have uh, configured them to go um, uh, instantly and, you know, automatically without any intervention. But uh, someone just in the last couple of months in the REDCAP community had a big problem when their survey was being flooded by a single person uh, uh, just hitting it multiple times to get multiple vouchers. So generally people are advised to not automate that, but um, uh, have that go via uh, a mediated manual process so they can make sure that only the right people are getting um, vouchers. There's a question from Sandra that I'm... Um, Struggling a little bit to understand, Sandra. Uh, I collected data for my PhD with Audit Maker Dat, which was decommissioned in 2019. Um, <clears throat> and so, in the process of creating a, a Dat DAT in RedCap that mirrors the Audit Maker Dat for a future longitudinal project, can I store data from research conducted in RedCap to replicating prospective study? I don't fully understand the question, um, but you can re build and re, you can rebuild a project in REDCap that was conducted elsewhere. People at AC were doing this quite a lot. They're migrating already conduct, conducted projects uh, into REDCap to store the data. Um, and in future, when they're reconducting the um, data abstraction tool, right? Um, uh, uh, and this, right, you're saying this is exactly what you mean. That's, that's good, I'm on the right track. Um, uh, people are, uh, say, you know, people have been conducting research projects in, in, in Qualtrics, and then they've been realizing that they need to use RedCap for, for this going forward. So they've been rebuilding their surveys in RedCap as projects, importing all the data, and then rerunning uh, from there on. So um, since RedCap is effectively a database, you can, you can import records from, from previous studies, no problem. Well, okay. that looks like all our questions, which is excellent timing because we're about yeah. to um, close off. Great. That sounds like that's answered Sandra's question as well. That's a good thanks. Good point to thanks finish. So, question, Sandra. Thanks everyone for your time today. Um, like we said, um, 
for our people at, mem uh, at our member institutions, feel free to contact your local e-research analyst. Uh, those external, um, you can contact that email there, training at intersect. Institution, we'd be happy to help you out. Uh, and like I said, you could also see our training. If you head to our website, intersect.org.au, you'll be able to see all the upcoming training. Um, and like I said, it's not just on tools like REDCap and Qualtrics, we also do training multiple programming languages, uh, other data management tools as well. We mentioned in Vivo in the training is one of our currently very popular courses. Um, we also do training in Excel as well, other tools such as OpenRefine uh, and SQL and databases. So I'd strongly encourage you to go and have a look at that. And um, yeah, feel free to get in contact at any time with any questions that you might have. Thanks everyone. And we'll see you at the next webinar, which is in next month. Yes, early October it will be. Um, and that'll be open for registration, I believe, later this week. Great. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.